Um, yeah, we had cake and it was calorie free. Of course. On your birthday, it's always calorie free. Which, which Lynn? Lynn McGrath from our Charmy campus. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, it was Lynn's birthday, so it was great. Kylie Smith, uh, um, global internet pastor. <laughs> um, thank you yeah. for being our special guest tonight. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we're trying to get the honorarium up to get you there. So um, good to see you. Bev Becker. Yes. Bev Becker, it seems like I haven't seen you forever. I know. Yeah. Are you still on this planet or have you been raptured? <laughs> or have I been raptured, maybe? You have, Bev. I'm zooming, I'm zooming from uh, the waters, not, not the third heaven. It's soft. Hang on, sorry, wait. I just have to turn my volume up. I can't hear you. Oh, there you go. Oh, great. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I am uh, zooming from the Central Coast. We are. Anton, good evening. Um, uh, I'm glad to see our lawyers on, just to make sure we keep it all legal, uh, legal in the spirit. Uh, yeah, the clock's running. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, good, good evening, and I'm sure a couple more will jump on. Great to see Mark Hopper from Jubilee uh, with us. G'day. Uh, so good to have you with us as well, Mark. And uh, Sonia and McCain and Andrew, Elizabeth Kobe from Maitland campus. Uh, we've got just about every campus represented. Tim Owen is from our Newcastle campus, which is great. Um, oh, Douglas Shea, uh, my good friend from Sydney, is on. Paul, great to great to see you tonight. I'm um, I'm really uh, really excited uh, to just take this time tonight on this prophetic Zoom. I feel like. Um, uh, when Ethan, my son, actually was asking me about, it, he said to me, "Dad, what are you going to share um, on on the Zoom that's coming up on the prophetic one?" I just said to him, "You know, I I really believe that um, I want to share a, a, a teaching, a perspective, maybe on the prophetic that I don't hear spoken a lot uh, in in kind of you know social media land and all the rest." But actually, it has to do with this title that I've, I've called it. Um, what I want to just sort of touch on tonight, this thought about how to be discerning prophets in uncertain times. And, you know, we, we understand that in the prophetic functionality, there is a, a, a gift set in Corinthians that talks about the discerning of spirits, right? The discerning of spirits. And really what, it, what that means, that, that gracing of the discerning of spirits, is the ability, the prophetic ability to, to when, you know, when a situation's in front of you or sometimes a person's in front of you, to carry a, um, it's not suspicion, by the way, it's a discernment to understand what's actually happening in the spirit world in front of you. Is, is what's transpiring a, a, a manifestation of a demonic thing, is the thing that's transpiring in front of you, the manifestation of a just a, a soulish thing, a fleshly thing, or is the thing that's manifesting in front of you something that is of the Spirit of God and, uh, and the work of God? That's what the discerning of spirits carries. I want to sort of blow that up a bit more tonight on this Zoom and I want to just really, um, I think for this company, the, 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 the grouping that's going to come here tonight, is to really talk about in the midst of great challenges, whether they be challenges in the marketplace, whether they be challenges in the church in general, uh, challenges in the, in the nations, it seems like there's this frenetic uh, energy um, in the prophetic that wants to declare what's going on um, and declare it maybe, hopefully, uh, trying to declare it from a perspective that they believe that, that we believe that God is saying. But here's the interesting thing about that. I've spoken to a number of um, apostolic uh, ministers uh, nationally and now globally. And, and you know, for many of them, uh, I'll tell you where the conversation's gone. The conversation's gone. They've said, you know, Dave, our reflection of some of the prophetic movement at the moment is that it's like the prophets are playing catch up, trying to play catch up on this whole COVID thing and this whole um, 
calamity, as it were, this challenge that's hit the earth. Uh, because if we, if we can be just um, transparent a little bit, in general, and, and, I, and I say this in general, the prophetic movement um, globally, even nationally, we must say that, that if we're just going to be really honest, we did, not, um, we did not declare, discern this season very well. Um, I'm not saying that no prophets um, called what was, what was coming. I'm not saying that. There, there were some. I've got to say, though, those voices, those prophetic voices were drowned out greatly by an overwhelming chatter in the prophetic movement that was looking somewhere else and, um, and, and, and in many respects missed, uh, missed what was happening. You, you know, the prophetic uh, is, is, people say the prophetic is, is, should be the church's um, radar system, if you think about it in a crude sense, radar system of what, um, not, not only what's in the future, but how, like, what is God doing now? Like the discerning of the times that really rests respectfully in the prophets and in the prophetic movement. So, so in some respects, um, you know, if we can just be, uh, like I said, transparent, the prophetic um, movement in general, there was not a lot, not, not, not calling really what was going on here. Now, what's happened since then over the last couple of months is people have tried to go back into certain history files of certain prophets or certain predominant ministers and pull out some things that they've said and try and match, um, you know, this season. But I, I've got to tell you, with all integrity, just with all integrity, um, I find that quite, I find that kind of microwaving prophecy. I, I, I don't I don't subscribe to that. Uh, some of them that I've that I've heard suggested um, weren't actually prophesying COVID. They were they were prophesying out of an eschatology that was calling calamity and and end of the world stuff, and they've been doing that for the last fifty years. So to go and microwave some statement and then go, oh, that matches the the pandemic or something is just not, I just don't think it's prophetically integrous. But I, I want to give you a scripture and I kind of want to, I want to jump in here tonight, really talking about this scripture. And it's, it's not in the prophetic movement. This scripture is, is a real keynote scripture because it's about the sons of Issachar, right? But I want to go a little bit deeper and I want to explore a little bit about the sons of Issachar tonight. And it says, it's in the, the keynote scripture is 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32. 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32 says, Of the sons of Issachar, um, men who understood the times with the knowledge of what Israel should do, their chiefs were 200 and their kingsmen were at their command. This scripture speaks about this tribe of Israel, one of the one of the twelve tribes, tribe of Issachar, coming to to David's camp while Saul is still king, and they come and they, as it were, begin to pledge their allegiance to David while Saul is still alive and still king, because the men of Issachar discerned that there was going to be a change in the timing in the times that were on Israel. The change in the times was there was going to be a change. This is before Saul is dead, by the way. They discerned that there was going to be a change of the king and that David, the outcast, the, you know, the renegade, I mean, he, David had been, war, he'd been uh, running with the Philistines. So it wasn't like he was, you know, second in line to the throne. Second in line to the throne at this point is Jonathan. But somehow the Bible says that the, this tribe of Issachar discerned something about the times in which they lived. They discerned that there was, something was about to change and the seasons that they had been in under the reign of Saul, there was going to be a disruption to those seasons. The time were going to be changed and there was a new season that was about to come. 
I really believe that part of, you know, what I want to say we need to own in the prophetic movement and then as a prophetic company um, look to not repeat uh, in next time is I believe that we missed a major juncture here um, with regards to the changing of a time and in, in the spirit and in the nations and in the earth. We, we, we miss that. And uh, that doesn't mean that it's all doom and gloom and all the rest, but, but there, needs to be some, there needs to be some reflection here that says, why did we miss it? What do we need to change? And how do we need to build differently moving forward? Um, I'm, uh, I'm right in the midst of, <laughs> I, I felt inspired over the last couple of weeks to begin writing a book um, that I'm going to publish, a prophetic book called The Building Prophets. And uh, I, I think I can see Daniel Zelli online here. Um, it's something that, that, that Daniel and I, uh, when we had a discussion a couple of years ago, something that jumped up, hey, Dan, how you doing? Um, something that jumped up in my spirit uh, and in Daniel's spirit while we were talking, and it was, it's something that's just sort of stayed within me of this advocation for a greater building dimension around the prophetic movement and the prophets. I believe that if you're functioning in a prophetic grace, it should be building something dynamic in your life. The prophetic shouldn't just be a blessing to you. I love blessing. I'm, I'm not against blessing. I, it should be. And there is a blessing component around the prophetic. However, however, the greater ministry of the prophetic is always building. As a matter of fact, it's the greater, the greater purpose of all kingdom ministry is to build to build the kingdom, to build the structures, the, the, the substructures of God, the infrastructure of, of heaven, as it were, uh, in our lives, firstly, in our community, secondly. And then, you know, if we do well with that, maybe God will entrust us with nation building. You know, I, I think it's something that the church as yet has not entered into because um, by and large, the church has remained in a blessing mode and uh, hasn't, hasn't allowed the deepening of God to take us into building. Now, I want to I just unpack here for a moment something about this tribe of Issachar, because I feel like it's got application for us. Uh, I'm talking about you as a prophetic uh, orientated believer, if you weren't a prophetic orientated believer, or potentially a prophet or an emerging prophet, you wouldn't be online here tonight. Um, the fact that you're online in this prophetic Zoom means that you've got a proclivity for this. But let me, let me give you a, a little bit of a background with regards to this tribe of Issachar and who they were. The tribe of Issachar were known for, in the natural, this tribe studied the movements of the stars and the planets and understood the chronological seasons in which they lived in. So the first thing I want you to understand is that the tribe of Issachar were highly competent people that understood actually the natural dimensions, well, we, what, what they would think is natural dimensions. They were, <laughs> they were astrologers, believe it or not. They were responsible uh, for calling the whole nation of Israel uh, together and telling them when the time of the feasts, when they should do certain feasts, depending on what was happening in the stars, what the moon was, go was going on with the moon, what was going on with the sun. They were the ones that the nation of Israel waited uh, to call them to different, uh, different religious festivals. Um, when, when, super, when signs happened, like signs in the heavens, right, happened in the sun, moon, and the stars, the sons of Issachar were always called upon to bring an interpretation of what that meant in the earth. I mean, this might, I know this is something, when I first heard this many years ago, I, I, I kind of went, hang on a second, like, are you telling me that these guys were like, were they into horoscopes and all that? And, and, and I want to say to you, no, that's not what I'm talking about, right? They, we're not talking about that hocus pocus, but we are talking about a tribe that was entrusted by the nation 
to actually be able to interpret the, the, the uh, physical phenomena of the sun, moon and stars going on and, um, and, and be able to interpret what that meant in the natural. So they were, uh, what I want you to hear here is they were highly proficient in understanding the natural uh, order of things that was going on in the earth. Jesus challenges the nation of Israel around this issue of failing to have even um, to go beyond simply understanding natural signs. He says to, he says to the nation of Israel in Matthew 16, verse one to four, this is when the Pharisees come to Jesus and they're trying to say to him, hey, burp a miracle uh, to prove that you're the Messiah, right? And he says to them um, on, in Matthew 16, he says, um, you can read the signs of the weather for you say red sky at night is a sailor's delight or red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. He says, you're so adept at forecasting the weather by reading the obvious, obvious signs of the times. But then he says, a wayward and uh, wicked generation always asks for these other type of signs. But the only sign that you're going to get right now is the sign of Jonah. And he basically says to them, you know, uh, the sign of Jonah is, is, is all the relation to Jesus' death, life and resurrection, right? So, so it's interesting to me that Jesus challenges the nation of Israel and he says to them, because um, you understand that Jesus comes to change the time, uh, Israel from, from, uh, from Mosaic Israel to kingdom Israel. He's about to change the times on them and they fail to discern it accurately. And, and I want you to see what happens when they fail to discern it. In Luke 19, verse 41, Jesus says to the nation of Israel, it says, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it saying, if you had known in this day, even the things which make for your peace, in other words, if you'd known the season, if you knew the time that was dawning upon you, he says, but now these things have been hidden from your eyes. In other words, you've missed prophetically what I'm doing in the earth right now in coming, in me coming to Jerusalem. And he says, uh, for the days, and then he says, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will be thrown up and a barricade against you uh, and surround you and hem you in every, every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, they will leave you, uh, they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. There are things, listen to this, there are things that we miss uh, as far as God's desire into the nations uh, when we fail to bring the discerning uh, of the times. See, I, I got to say to you that in the prophetic movement, we've got to go way beyond, way beyond personal blessing, personal prophecy. We, we've got to go way beyond those things. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have those things, but, but the prophetic movement must be more, must be more than just respectfully some Christian version of tarot card readings. Like it's, it's got to go beyond that. The, the role of the prophetic in the earth and in the church uh, has to go way deeper than just what's my blessing, what's my word, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow um, for my blessing. It says here that the sons of Issachar not only understood they were, they were savvy around, they understood the political climate of what was going on in their midst. I think this is really important. Um, you know, for many years, the political, the political cli uh, uh, climate has almost been like, oh, that's not something that the church should understand or, or be engaged with. But you know, the men of Issachar absolutely understood the political climate uh, what was going on? Uh, I'm not saying everyone, by the way, needs to be a, a needs to be you know an expert on um, on politics or things like that. But but the men of Issachar knew it. But but he, here's the interesting thing: the men of Issachar carried a discernment that way be, went beyond the natural and went into the supernatural. It says here that the sons of Issachar could discern what God was doing and who He was doing it with. 
They knew when one move of God was finishing, the, the reign of Saul was finishing, and a new move was coming, the reign of David was coming. They could tell, um, you know, when, when it was time for the next leader to come. Here's the interesting thing. Do you know that the men of Issachar were the, were the main tribe that supported Deborah when she rose up as a judge in Israel? Now, we might go, well, wow, that, what, what is that about? Well, here's the thing. It was a very radical notion to support that God, at that time, that God was raising up a woman leader. It, it was radical. But it says that the sons of Issachar understood that and they rallied behind Deborah when she arose as a judge in Israel. The men of Issachar obviously backed David when he rose into prominence, even while Saul was still on the throne. Um, their ability to discern the times and the seasons gave them great advantage. Can you imagine, can you imagine, listen for a moment around this, can you imagine prophetically if we could tap into this deeply, deeply understanding to be able to not just prophesy what are we hearing but actually to have a prophetic understanding of what god is doing in our time like what god is doing in our in our day and in our in our even in our nation i mean i really i really believe actually that um as the as the prophetic movement re-engages in this discerning of of the times that that it's at that point that actually we're going to be able to regain our voice um, into the spheres of power and the spheres of authority. Because right now, I've got to say to you, and I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to be transparent on this Zoom, I don't hear too many people, too many civic leaders, too many presidents or prime ministers calling the church and asking them what they feel uh, God is up to. I, I don't see those phone calls happening right now. And um, not, not in a general sense. And the reason for it is we haven't earned the right. Um, we haven't earned the right because we haven't modelled the prophetic. I don't believe we've modelled the prophetic um, in such a way that gives confidence for those type of leaders, civic leaders, to call on us. Um, the men of Issachar, um, they had inside knowledge uh, of what God was up to in the earth. Um, I, I'm hearing a lot of noise I'm not hearing a lot of revelation. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, they weren't taken by surprise when something was happening. They had influence as a result of their unique ability. Kings would not, the nation and kings would not make a move without first going and uh, 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 asking the 200 leaders uh, of the men of Issachar that were part of the Sanhedrin at the time. Uh, they knew what Israel should do before it was done, and the nation followed their example. Um, I want to say this. I want to say that, you know, there's a, an opportunity in all crisis, and I think there's a gift in this crisis of COVID and all that's happened. I think there's a gift to the prophetic movement um, to invite us to go deeper to in, invite us to build differently, um, you know, the expression of or the representation of the voice of God in the earth. You, you know, fundamentally, I wrote here, um, you know, the main role of, of the prophetic grace is to, re, it, it's an invitation. Um, when the prophetic is expressed, it's an invitation to really know God's character to know God's ways, to know God's mind, and to know God's timing. And um, if, if we're going to represent God properly, somehow we have to, in the prophetic movement, model this, this dynamic of, knowing, of, of reflecting in the prophetic. Uh, the prophetic must, must reflect God's character, reflect his ways, his mind and his timing. I just believe we've been playing at the shallow end of the pool for too long. I feel like there's something so much more available to us. I believe that God wants to bring it for us. I want to just touch um, a little bit on some hindrances that I believe 
that the prophetic movement and I'll, you know, you know, we, I just examine my own heart in this, um, has struggled with and has kept us, um, as it were, at the shallow end of the pool. The first major challenge of the prophetic movement is celebrity prophets. I don't believe, like, I, and having said that, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to take a swing here at just because someone has a big ministry. I, I actually think the celebrity issue is the church made them celebrities. I don't think they made themselves celebrities. And so, you know, one of the hindrances is the celebrity prophets. There's always going to be leaders. God will always raise up men and women that carry uh, powerful, not, not just anointings, but callings uh, at a global level. And I think that that's appropriate. The thing we need to remember that the role of the Ascension gift prophets, whether they're globally called or national prophets or regional prophets, is the equipping of the saints, not the manifestation of ministry. The major role of all prophetic ministry, irrespective of what Metron, whether it's global, national or regional, is the priority is the equipping of the saints not the doing of the ministry themselves. So, so if we're going to have champions in the prophetic, I say they sh how, we should, how we should measure them is not simply by the, the, grand, the, the, the bombasticness of their prophetic declaration, but how many people are they empowering? How much of the body of Christ are they absolutely setting on fire in the marketplace? Uh, how many, you know, how many people are they setting on fire in in just all the spheres of society? That's 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 to me where the shift needs to come. We need to move away from the celebrity profit dimension, and the problem with that is, of course, that that some of Mammon has gotten into some sectors of the church, and so we've commoditized everything. You know, we've commoditized the prophetic. Uh, I'm not saying that, by the way, we shouldn't honour, uh, financially honour ministries. We absolutely should. You know, I'm, I'm not against any of that. But I just think that whole, there's a fine line between the promotion of the kingdom and the marketing of ourselves. There's a, there's a fine line. And, and, and only, only you know, you know, you can know whether you've crossed that or not. The second major hindrance with regards to the prophetic movement's functionality is our individualistic ministry models that, that, that we've been pulled into a corner, even this pressure. I know when I travel, there's such pressure of, you know, my word, my blessing, you know, this sort of thought about, you know, if, if I go somewhere and it's almost like if I don't, if I don't prophesy individually, to certain people, it's almost like, you know, there's a disappointment and they've gone, well, I don't know if you fulfilled your prophetic assignment because you didn't prophesy over 35 people, you know, in this meeting. And it was like, hang on, but what if I came and actually brought a prophetic dimension that opened the ears, the prophetic ears of 150 people in the congregation? What if when I leave, your congregation is able to hear the Lord better isn't that a better outcome than another 30 of them getting a prophetic word that they're going to put in their journal and maybe put on their bookshelf? You know, I, I, I remember being so discouraged uh, in the late 90s. I looked around. I was a part of a very large church, and I looked around one Sunday morning. I was a prophet in the house, and I looked around, and I thought, you know what? I could, I could each, each, you know, key family in this church here carries three or four outstanding prophetic words. We'd had prophets come through, oh man, just over the several years. But years later, I, I knew that many, most of those families were not walking and, and the words had not adjusted them in any way, shape or form. They weren't false prophetic words, by the way. I don't believe they were false prophetic words. No one had taught them what to do once you get a prophetic word. <laughs> you know, it was like, they just thought, oh, well, you put that on the shelf and then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because God does all the heavy lifting. And, um, and you know, one day it'll just happen and, you know, things will come together. And, and that wasn't the case at all. 
So the second hindrance to this thought about really operating in a, in a grace, an Issachar grace of discernment in the prophetic is this individualistic notion. Here's the, here's the third major hindrance. The third major hindrance is, uh, this is going to be a little, uh, well, everything I say is going to be controversial, so I'll just say it. Um, when you have a short-sighted understanding of the work of the cross and you make it purely, and I hear what I'm about to say, purely limited to a salvitic experience rather then, and I'll explain this in a moment, rather than a cosmological consequence. What that means is this. If you understand the work of the cross purely, purely as God doing that to get people to heaven, if that's all the cross was about, that Jesus dies on the cross so that human, humans can find salvation and get to heaven, if that's your understanding of the cross, that's a salvitic understanding of the cross, but it's limited because the kingdom or a cosmological understanding says this, that through the cross, not only was God reconciling mankind to himself, which he was, but he was reconciling all of creation. That means that the earth is the Lord's and the, God hasn't abandoned the earth. He hasn't said, you know what? The devil can have the earth and I'll just take the people. God says, no, you know what? I've died for the sins of everyone and I'll have creation back. Thank you very much. And to, like, so, so the cross is cosmological as well as salvitic. That's such an important understanding because if you don't understand that from a prophetic discernment, you will not, you will not pursue God with regards to what is your plan for the nations. You won't, you won't, you won't have that capacity within you because it won't be in your frame of reference that God is restoring not just salvation of people, but actually the nations back to himself. So important. Um, such an important distinction, this thought of the kingdom. I did a, um, an Instagram live a little while back with a great, great prophet. I mean, I'm talking about this as a, someone who's, you know, global. And um, offline, we were talking and she says to me, you know, Dave, she says, I've never, I've never heard that message of the kingdom. I've never really thought about it as a prophet. I, I've always been contained within this thought about, you know, God really wants people to get to heaven. And so the prophetic is just about evangelism. You know, it's just about salvation and evangelism. And, um, you know, uh, I, I've got a mentor of mine that said, if, if, if all God wanted to do was get people to heaven, when we get them saved, he should kill them straight away so they could get to heaven. You know, like if, I mean, let's get the deal done, right? If, if that's what it's all about. If there's no purpose of reconciling the nations back to himself, no, 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 uh, no goal, as it were, to re-Eden the earth, then, yeah, if we're just getting people to exit the earth to get to heaven, they should just get saved and then die, you know. But but this is a hindrance. It's a massive hindrance. It's something that the men of Issachar did not subscribe to. And that's why they, they pressed in, in their prophetic dimensions, pressed in to really ask God, what are you doing in the earth? What are you doing in the nations? What's your timing? Like what times are we living in? And what is the season cycle of that? I really believe, you know, I've got to say to you, I believe that we as we as we sort of came into the 2000s i actually believe that we you know people have been saying this thought about a reformation that we're in a third reformation which i absolutely agree on i believe that we're in a changing of the times um not you know not the natural i'm talking about in the spirit and as a result of that there's there there is um a, a new seasons that are coming on the earth um, but, but to be truthful, it's kind of like the remnant within the church uh, get that prophetically and, and the rest will begin to outwork that eventually. I, I've got a great mentor of mine that says, Dave, I think we're 20 years in to a two to 300 year, uh, two, two to 300 year move of God. You know, he says, I think we're 
Like we're, we're really at the, at, the, at the start of things that are about to change. You know, the next 500 years of church is not going to be the same as the last 500. Let me give you this fourth hindrance. And this is going to be the most controversial of all that I'm going to say tonight. Um, so, you know, anyway, we might as well just do it, right? The fourth hindrance with regards to discernment, I believe, in the prophetic movement is a misunderstanding about the fullness of times. If you want to use a theological word, eschatology. I am really, I'm really concerned and have been for a long time. You know, the church suffered great damage in the 1970s and the 1980s around an over stimulation about cataclysmic things that were supposedly about to break on the church at that time. Books were written declaring, you know, when Jesus was going to return or that, you know, it was like two years away. And, you, you know, I, I just say, um, I, I don't mind necessarily, you know, kind of how you think things are going to wrap up theologically, except to say to you this, you just need to be very careful in the, as a prophetic person when, you, when you're hearing the Lord because of our filter systems. Most people don't know this, but there are four orthodox ways of actually understanding end times, four of them, not one, four. The other three aren't heresy. So whichever one you hold, all I'm trying to say to you is this as a prophetic person, whichever one you hold, you can hold that so long as you understand intention that there are three other perspectives that orthodoxy allows or can accept that are biblical. Now, I'm not saying all four are right because all four have some different nuances with them. All I'm saying is you've got to be careful when you begin to say, thus saith the Lord, and you propagate your perspective. You've got to hold intention. Actually, there are three others uh, that, that are just as valid theologically. So you've just got to be careful about what you call. There has been more end time prophetic words in the last 90 days across the stratosphere of social media. And I think that all it does is exposes an Achilles heel in the prophetic movement because we, I think most of that has got nothing to do with prophecy. It's got to do with anxiety, right? It's got to do with anxiety. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that, that there's not a place for the understanding of the fullness of times. There, there is, there, there really is. But it's very difficult in uncertain times to be emphatic about it. And you know what? Your margin for error is pretty obvious if you miss it. So, you know, I heard some crazy things about, well, that's it. You know, the, this, the Sabbath 2020, the Sabbath you know, Easter, uh, that's it. You know, it's, you know, Jesus is coming on a white horse. I mean, you know, the margin for error, right? <laughs> like, it's not like, you know, a general thing. Like, if you miss that, you miss that. And, and, and here's the other thing. I had a guy, I had a, a guy that's trying to tell me he's a prophet, uh, send me a message telling me that I should put up his YouTube videos, right, about all this. And um, he's, and I said to him, before I watched any of the videos, I was just trying to be gracious. And I said to him, hey, love to know more. Who, who, like, like, who do you hang around? Who's, who, who knows you? And who do you know? You know? And um, he couldn't answer the question because he was a prophetic guy trying to prophesy out of a cave. Now, here's the thing. I've been around the church for a while. I've had, I've had every, like, I've had just, just about, I've had the guy, I've had a guy turn up at the church trying to tell me that he's the one of the two prophets in the book of Revelation and that he carries the secret to the end of the world. And I wasn't sure whether we were going to punch on or I was going to pray for him. In the end, we didn't punch on. I did pray for him. But then he told me that he had to leave because he had to go to Queensland to make sure that the end of the world didn't happen. Well, I'm glad he went to Queensland because that was two years ago. And so he must have stopped something going on. So I was really happy about that.
But here's the thing. You know what? I, I just think, I just think that if God, you know, if God is going to download a major download around something cataclysmic, um, he's probably going to tell more than one or two prophets. Can I just say that? I think he's going to speak uh, dynamically through the prophetic movement and through through the church and through his prophets. So these these four hindrances, I, I just think it's something that we need to um, we need to be be aware of. So so okay, I've just told you about four things that'll stuff us up around this space. So then, how do we deepen? Because here's the here's the thought for tonight about I want to give you something practical. How do we deepen our discernment and our ability to prophetically go deeper into the discerning of the times, discerning of the seasons, and know what is God saying? to his church at this time. So I just gave you four hindrances. Let me give you four handles on how to deepen our discernment uh, moving forward. The first one is this. Prophets and prophetic people must learn how to walk in prophetic companies. The thought of prophets hiding in caves or by themselves, um, just them and the Lord. Uh, I'm sorry, um, New Testament biblical protocol does not endorse that prophetic companies you'll always find prophets in clusters and prophetic peoples in clusters that's why you know what if you want to grow in the prophetic you've got to do it with others that's bottom line you've got to do it with others um, you will never attain you'll never come into the fullness of your prophetic functionality if you want to do this by yourself um, doesn't matter how much of an introvert you are. Doesn't matter how how much of a seer prophet, how grandiose your dreams are. Um, if you want to come into a heightened level of prophetic functionality and discernment, you must do it in companies. The second thing is this: uh, if you're going to operate, if we're going to operate at heightened levels of prophetic discernment, we must align to kingdom leaders. We must align to kingdom leaders. The prophetic movement, uh, I'm going to say this at a local level, at a regional level, at a national level, and at a global level, the prophetic movement must align to fivefold leadership, particularly the apostolic and the apostles in the earth. Absolutely non-negotiable. When God says first apostles, second prophets in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, when he marries apostles and prophets in Ephesians 2.20, um, they're not just divine suggestions. It's actually a divine code. Apostles and prophets must learn how to function together if they're going to come into great functionality. i tell you why this is so important. Because the saints, here's the, the bottom line is always this, the saints suffer when kingdom leadership and kingdom expression of these gracings don't uh, don't walk in kingdom order, it's the saints that don't get adequately uh, enhanced in the marketplace, in the political spheres, in the in their businesses, in in their homes, in their schools. I mean, uh, th there's something about this. I'm working right now with a kingdom leader in a nation in Europe, and um, he's asked me he. he the reason he reached out to me was um, he, he met me once uh, just in a conference and then um, he had a dream in which I was in the dream and he felt the Lord said to him that he's, he, had to, he had to call me and invite me to walk with him uh, in this. He, he feels he's been called to um, move in national transformation. It's a significant businessman and walking with actually a politician, a federal politician in that nation that carries a prophetic word um, from, from the, his time in Bethel, a Christian politician who carries a prophetic word that he will become the prime minister of that nation in Europe. And, um, you know, I, I, I've been, uh, you know, so we've been talking strategy and all the rest, but I actually believe that until the apostolic and the prophetic in that nation comes into alignment, um, we're actually, we don't have a green light to, to do even that. We don't have a green light because there's something that's released in that. So the deepening of the prophetic is always going to be 
uh, aligned to kingdom leadership. The third one is this, that um, if we're going to be discerners of the time, we must be prophets that have the word of God as in the Bible. We must know it deeply inside of us. I, I don't know why it is that somehow in the prophetic movement and in the operation of the gift of prophecy, I find many biblical illiterate prophets who can tell me about all the great dreams they've had and all the, the supernatural encounters they had, but probably have a very basic understanding of theology. I, I think that's a recipe for disaster, actually. I think it's a recipe for disaster. I think that prophets should know the word of God. Like, I'm not just talking about like have a basic, I'm talking about be, be powerfully, uh, have, have powerful theology, like have powerful understanding of exegesis and all the biblical dynamics, you know, like it, it takes nothing away from your prophetic uh, input and your prophetic power. It absolutely enhances it. And I think that we need to return to that. There needs to be such a championing of theology um, at a dynamic level within the prophetic movement. I, I really believe that we will not be able to speak to nations and have true discernment whilst we remain uh, beginners uh, around the word. And so anyway, that's the fourth one is this to carry this spirit of discernment and to have a depth of the prophetic. I, I think one of the master keys of the prophetic is great humility, great humility. There's something about um, the Gnostic struggle with this, by the way, there's something about secret knowledge, supposedly secret knowledge that has within it, uh, a propensity to puff us up. And uh, unless there's like the only way actually that prophets can walk in great humility is they have to allow the process of suffering to be an integral part of their journey. <laughs> I, I, I know many prophets that run at every smell of suffering, at every smell of, you know, um, rejection and, and, uh, because I've because I got to say to you that most of the suffering, by the way, will be at the hands of your brothers and sisters. Um, you know, the, the, the suffering that you will face at the hands of the enemy and the hands of, um, of, of the heathen is nothing, nothing compared to the suffering that you will face at the hands of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, uh, that needs to happen. And, um, and you've got to understand when it does, um, suffer well. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not a masochist. I'm not saying, hey, you know, pray for it. I'm just saying that it's part of the prophetic process. The, if you don't, as a prophetic person in prophetic ministry, go through seasons, seasons, not just a moment, seasons of the dark night of the soul, the, what you'll miss is the crushings of God. You'll miss the crushings of God. And if you miss the crushings of God, you'll miss the ability, the fashioning of God as a real vessel of his. There's just something about brokenness. There's something about, um, you know, coming to a place of being unoffendable and, and truly surrendered that, that, that is that is a necessary recipe and and you know one of the things one of our challenges in our day and I, I just say this with great great pain in my heart is that one of the challenges of social media is that it gives platforms to pro emerging prophets and emerging prophetic people that have not been processed by the lord and so they build websites and facebook pages and ministry followings and um there's no tempering in them. And as a result of it, um, there's usually a real lack of humility in their expression and a lack of depth uh, about them when they bring a word of the Lord. There's just not the, the, the workings of God. You just kind of go, 
oh man, that, that person just hasn't been processed yet. And I find that there's a great danger there, um, a great danger. And unfortunately, it, it, it gets propagated. So this thing about um, the thing I wanted to really kind of bring forward just in this snippet tonight was this thing about, I really believe that the prophetic movement needs to take a moment and a breath, and we need to be careful to not fill the airwaves with continued white noise or try and overcompensate for anything. I think that there's a real opportunity in the uncertain times to allow the, the, the process of God to say, you know what, we need to, we need to do things differently and we need to um, prepare differently. So the next thing, whatever the next thing is, once we get to post-COVID, um, uh, by the way, post-COVID is not going to look like pre-COVID. <laughs> um, uh, that, one's, that one's for free, by the way. That's a, that you can quote me on that one. Um, I'll, I'll be held accountable to that. Post-COVID will not look like pre-COVID. The, the times have changed and um, many things will never be the same, but it requires, also what it requires is a, a real um, shift in the prophetic movement. And I, I do believe that's coming, by the way. Um, and we're going to see a whole bunch of different prophetic expression come forward at a local church level, um, which is what we've been trying to express, um, you know, regionally through through Hope UC. I can only speak for that. And then, obviously, I, I can see some great friends on here as well. And I know that Mark uh, down there in Jubilee, Dan Daniel Zelli has been, you know, as well, really pushing into these spaces, and uh, and others um, that are that are really looking for and contending. Uh, for something of of a of an Issachar grace um, that carries discernment and um, yeah a different a different way. Um, I I wonder I, I I promise to keep this to one hour, but I'd love um, I, I'd love Daniel Zelly. Would you mind just unmuting yourself for a moment? I I'd love to just hear a couple of reflections, maybe as you've been listening. And then Mark Hopper, I'd love to come to you for a moment. I, I actually want to somehow introduce both of you guys to the group here um, so they can hear you. Um, but I wonder if you just take a, a minute or two each and just, just kind of um, speak in, into, into this space from your, your, your own reflections. Daniel, would you un unmute? Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Thanks, David. I really appreciate that. I so concur and agree with everything you said tonight. And in fact, a lot of what you said carried a lot more depth than uh, may have appeared just in the communication. There was a lot of depth there. But I do believe that part of discerning the times, there was a fear in the prophetic to bring a, what I would call a warning prophecy. And that's because that was called a judgment prophecy and you don't want to be called a judgment prophet and uh, you know you want to be a blessing prophet and not a judgment prophet and so there was this uh, almost a fear or a reluctance to bring any sense of uh, you know a warning or something like that but we know it's biblical from you know acts and things like that so we know it is biblical yeah. but um, there was this fear so I think that was a lot of the reason why you know the COVID wasn't called out if you ask me I don't doubt the prophetic i just think people weren't focused and when you give attention is what you draw out and because people weren't focused in that area they uh, they didn't draw those things out now i'm not an advocate at all that um you know to bring a warning prophet you need to condemn or anything actually con condemnation is not of god and it, it's definitely not the the vehicle of the prophetic uh but uh, a warning prophet always will bring people towards god and if you receive a warning then you know how to pray and intercede so you can alleviate that, that, uh, that warning and, you know, do some good. So whether it's a warning prophet or a blessing prophet um, or a warning prophecy or a blessing prophecy, it always has the same outcome yeah. to draw you closer to God. So I, I feel like there's a respect coming back to the prophetic in the area of being able to discern the times and call things out so that we can pray and intercede. And I, I've put out a word recently 
that there's a rising of a, a John the Baptist type prophets coming up at the moment, yeah. which say, you know, prepare ye the, you know, the, the way of the Lord, the kingdom of, of the Lord is at hand. There's yeah. a rising of that. And I think there's a wisdom and a maturity that needs to come into the next season, which is not one where we go back to the, you know, doom and gloom, but we go forward and we can become a lot more um, concise in discerning the times. I also want to pick up on one point, uh, David, about celebrity prophets and governments. Yeah. I work a lot with governments, as you know, but nobody knows about it. Yeah. And this is the truth that um, the celebrity st status in terms of the prophetic can actually inhibit yes. working with governments. My experience is that most people, and you know, prophets around this nation that are working with presidents, and, and, and but you don't know about them because those type of people, those high level people can't be seen to, to be with those prophets. You need to be almost like undercover. So I do concur that one of the limitations of discerning the times is uh, definitely, you know, that celebrity status thing. Uh, so that's enough from me, but thank you, David, for that invitation. I really appreciate it. Wow, oh, fantastic. Uh, Mark, would you unmute yourself, Mark Hopper? Um, love to just hear a couple of thoughts from you, buddy. Thanks, David. Yeah, wonderful to be here tonight and to hear some depth coming from you again. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't have a great amount, uh, much to reflect on. Actually, I was actually, interestingly enough, maybe it's prophetic, but I was connected with Daniel on the chat on the chat room because mm. I haven't connected with him and he, um, he felt uh, he needed to connect. So, um, mm. which I think maybe, maybe I'll just say that's prophetic that, uh, yeah, there needs to be a real, some yeah. connection happening, some company happening. I'm, I'm just beginning to, to understand and hunger um, after company and um, and working as a tribe yes. and uh, for the sake of, of regions and, and nations and cities. Um, yeah, uh, as I've shared with you, David, just that that understanding of, of when Jesus crossed over the lake with his you know, uh, disciples um, and he met the uh, demoniac. And I know you you prophesied that in, in the um, in the book, you know, the 2020 prophetic book. Yeah. But uh, taking, you know, God wanting to raise, raise up disciples that can speak to storms yeah. and can uh, move into new re regions. Um, and uh, like Dutch Sheets is saying, uh, disciple nations moving from that Mark um, 16 yes. um, kind of revelation of preaching the gospel to the Matthew 28, understanding that we are in a, in a season to to disciple nations but it's going to take a team and a tribe and a company yeah. uh, prophetic voices uh, working with uh, ap uh, apostolic um, movements as well uh, one picture I just uh, I had recently of, of a shoulder uh, mm. made up of shoulders uh, so I saw a shoulder and it was made up of shoulders 12 shoulders and God was saying um, thank you to the church for coming together in a unity because He's looking for somewhere to lay the key of David, uh, Isaiah 22, 22. And it was, I just saw a picture of, uh, it, uh, for me, it was apostolic shoulders coming together, but I think it's the shoulders within church, church bodies, our unity within the fivefold within movements. But God's looking for a place to rest a key, a key of governmental authority that is going to really um, take things to the next level, uh, you know, to this level of discipling nations and this nation. But I think there's a unity yeah. Uh, that is needed to come together, and I think this this right here, this Zoom, is is part of it. Um, yeah. And I'm excited to yeah to, to network and and uh, connect and um and see what God can actually do. I think yeah the other word that I sent to you, David, about this faith that's coming in. I saw Lana released a word about this yeah. this apostolic faith that's coming um upon the church and upon uh, networks as we come to unity is going to shift some mountains. Jesus said, we just need this mustard seed, but there's a faith coming that's going to really move some principalities and powers yeah. that have not been moved in the past, that have been pretty stubborn, and we haven't had the goods, uh, but there's mountains that, that have been controlling regions and areas uh, for too long, and yeah. I'm just excited, David, that we're going to see some movement, uh, and, and the prophetic must be right in there, partnering with the, with the apostolic, uh, being that voice and that nudge, and that encouragement and bringing strength, uh, like Haggai did. When when uh, so I'll just end with with Haggai. I love Haggai. He came in at the right moment, 
at the right time, he just said, guys, remember who you are. Remember what God has called you to do. Yeah, you know, you're meant to build this thing and, and finish this, this temple. Yeah. And, um, and so be strong and build. And, you know, strength came upon Zerubbabel, the apostle and the priest, and, and, uh, and, and they were stirred to build and finish the work. So uh, that's our job as prophets. Remember who you are. Remember what you're here for and be strong and build. Let's, yeah. let's, see, let's see this thing happen. Yeah. Amen. That's great. That's great. I'd love to love to just pray for you uh, on that's on the Zoom. Um, I just this this thought about a deepening grace of discernment. This the same grace, as it were, that the the Issachar tribe tapped into. That that you would carry a profoundness of discernment, whether it's around your business, whether it's around your family life, whether it's around your vocation whether it's around, you know, um, your church expression uh, that you're a part of. So let me just, just pray before I release you. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for everyone uh, on this Zoom that's going to hear this message, this, this dialogue. I thank you, God, that you're mustering your people into prophetic companies. I thank you, Father, even as we, as we look into your word and we see, God, how you dynamically operated through this tribe of Issachar. Father, I, just, I declare a greater discernment, God, upon the men and women in this, uh, in this uh, on the sound of my voice, in the, under this prayer, God, in their workplaces, God, that they would walk in and not just discern what's going on in the natural, but literally see, Father, in the spirit, have eyes to see and ears to hear, God, what you're saying. Lord, as we are going about our, our assignments and, Lord, in our regions and in our states and nation, God, and all that's happening there, Father, we just pray right now a great anointing, God, that, Lord, literally prophetic wisdom that unlocks doors and unlocks uh, your blueprints for, God, what you want to bring into the earth, Lord. We just thank you for it. We thank you for it manifesting itself in every sphere. We thank you, Lord, right across uh, the regions represented here, the Central Coast, Newcastle, Hunter Region, Sydney, Queensland uh, that are on this call. Father, in Jesus' name, we declare, Lord God, that the people of God will be, will be ready, Lord God, in the day of your power. We thank you for the church, God, coming into one of its finest hours. Lord, whilst the, the news and the media uh, bring fear and, and trepidation into the nation, Lord, we thank you for the prophetic word that comes forth and cuts through God and brings the life of God and the light of God into the nations, Father. We bless it, Lord. I bless each and every one. Lord, let there be an elevation in our spirits, an elevation in the prophetic grace manifested over every family and every home and every person. Father, we declare this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for engaging uh, our Zoom tonight, and I, I hope it was a blessing to you. Uh, I've recorded it. So uh, I'm going to pop it up so you, uh, online if you want to share that later on. Just if you, if you think, oh, look, someone should have, should have seen this, uh, I'd love to share it with them. It's going to be shareable probably tomorrow. So thank you so much. Um, I'm also going to put the notes up that I was speaking from tonight so that you can have them if you want to unshare them as well. Bless you. And uh, thank you for engaging with us. Uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.